Next item on the agenda is items for board discussion. Mr. Smith? Yes, Ms. Birdie, members of the board, we do have several items for board discussion this evening. Um, before we get to that first item, I would just like to make a comment. I had stepped out of the room earlier, uh, need to step out and uh, rejoin the meeting and uh, there at the end of the conversation about retiring teachers and uh, didn't didn't get to comment and, and I was reacclimating myself to where we were and uh, I do just want to say to those retirees just um, you know classroom teachers EAs bus drivers cafeteria workers you know every single one of those individuals dedicated their careers to serving kids and uh, and I'm sorry that we can't you know, recognize you in a more uh, formal environment. Um, and, uh, but I just want to say thank you so much um, for an entire career of service. Um, you've made a difference in the lives of thousands of kids and, and I just want you to know you are appreciated. So thank you. Um, items for board discussion. The first one, we have Board of Education uh, resolutions regarding public meetings and operation of schools. Uh, we do have two resolutions on the agenda uh, for this evening and uh, would like to just, um, I'm not going to read those resolutions or go into great detail, but I would like to highlight the sections in each of those resolutions so that the board has an understanding of those resolutions. The first one, uh, a resolution declaring an emergency and suspending board policy regarding the physical presence of board members and public participation at Fairfield City School District Board of Education meetings. Both of these resolutions are a direct result of uh, COVID-19 and House Bill 197. Um, so just wanted to highlight again that first resolution. There are five sections. Uh, section one, uh, basically just says public means of the board may be conducted with some or all members present via teleconference uh, or video conference, which is what we are doing this evening. Section two, public participation at meetings held via teleconference, video conference, or any similar electronic technology is suspended during such meetings. I would like to note that we did uh, remind our community members that while we are suspending um, public or participation uh, that their uh, you know their voices are important to us provided them with a link to our district directory um, just because they can't come to a public board meeting and sign up to speak doesn't mean that they don't have a voice so I would just like to share that with the board if in case you weren't aware of that uh, section three the board will provide electronic or telephonic means by which members of the public may attend or observe the meeting of the board, which is, again, we are streaming live on Facebook and announce that uh, to our public on multiple occasions, providing them with copies of the agenda and the PowerPoint presentations. Section four, appropriate legal notice to the public, news media, and those who have requested notice will be provided by reasonable methods. Thank you, Mrs. Lane. Uh, we do that every meeting and well Nancy does that every meeting and did so for this meeting as well section 5 this resolution shall be in full force and effect from and immediately after its adoption and shall supersede any prior policy resolution or act of this Board of Education that may be inconsistent with the provisions of this resolution our next resolution uh, a resolution for the continued operations of schools during the pendency of Executive Order 2020-01D, the Ohio Department of Health Director's order regarding the closure of all district K through 12 schools in the state of Ohio and the passage of amended substitute HB 197 signed by Governor DeWine on March 27, 2020. Again, I'd like to highlight uh, the sections uh, section one, school building closure, uh, addresses the fact that our buildings are closed and will remain through May 1, 2020, and as further ordered by the Ohio Department of Health, um, all school district buildings are closed to students. Section two, remote learning opportunities, 
The board hereby authorizes and adopts the attached continuity of learning plan identified as Exhibit A to provide for online learning opportunities. Uh, that exhibit is attached to your agenda. Section three, suspending board policy regarding student grading system. And this does have three parts. Uh, A, in order to provide appropriate educational opportunities to students through alternative methods to allow promotion from grade to grade and so as not as to penalize students who determine to complete assignments through the offered alternative means, the board modifies board policies regarding the awarding of grades as here and after described. Letter B, the board authorizes the superintendent and school administration to develop and implement a modification of current grading policies for each course or grade level within the Fairfield City School District's instructional program until such time as the state of emergency is lifted. And letter C, the board temporarily suspends any and all board policies concerning interscholastic athletic eligibility that are inconsistent, inconsistent with those requirements of the OHSAA for the fourth quarter. Basically, that's saying that, you know, we'll defer to OHSAA in regard to interscholastic athletic eligibility. Section four, graduation requirements. Superintendent, after consultation with the high school principal, is authorized to make any and all decisions concerning those students on track for graduation and determine whether or not the student has met the requirements for graduation, including regular education and special education students. Section five, teacher and administrator evaluations. For the 1920 school year, the board hereby delegates authority to the superintendent, treasurer, or their individual designees to determine and deem it impossible or impracticable to conduct an evaluation of any board employee in accordance with the Ohio Revised Code and board policies. Section six, effective date and ratification. This resolution shall be in full force and in effect from and immediately after its adoption and shall supersede and replace any prior resolution or act of, board, of this Board of Education. Section seven, compliance with public meeting laws. The Board of Education hereby finds and determines that all formal actions relative to the adoption of this resolution were taken in an open meeting of this Board of Education. So I know I, I read from it that I, I strategically read the highlights, um, the gist of each of those sections, um, and I hope that was helpful, but I would be happy uh, to answer any questions um, that you have. Um, John and, and I, uh, Mr. Clemens and I met and, and um, had some conversation, and Mandy was a part of that for the, the sections that pertain to teaching and learning. Um, so we've spent some time on that. And honestly, I think we were covered by House Bill 97, uh, 197, but we just wanted to err on the side of caution. So um, if you have any questions about either of those resolutions, be happy to entertain them. I do have uh, one question. What The effective date and ratification, um, since we began the remote learning, essentially on March 17th, is does that date need to change on this, Mr. Clemens? Uh, can you hear me, uh, Mr. Birdie? Yes, Mr. Clemens, I can hear you. Okay. I, I, what we were trying to say was that um, whatever actions that had been taken prior to today by those treasurer and the superintendent are ratified. So I think those earlier dates are covered, which I know you're in the second resolution. Which part are you in there? Um, Section two is remote learning opportunities. Um, I know there is a part um, I was referring to section section six, I believe, Mr. Yes. Birding is okay. Yes. Yeah, there there isn't really a retroactive date 
that limits it there. It says the actions of the superintendent and treasurer and their designees with respect to the continuation of instruction and nutrition and any other action taken by them on behalf of the district to date okay to date got it are ratified by this board of education so these continuity of learning things really started before you could meet so you're saying that was fine with us and we ratify that okay i just want to clarify that thank you mr clemens and the nutrition re relates to the continuation of the lunch program to the extent we have. Are there any other uh, questions from the board on item number one? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Smith, you can move on to item number two. All right, our next item for uh, board discussion, proposed master contract with the Fairfield Classroom Teachers Association, and I'll turn it over to Roger Martin. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Mr. Birding, members of the board. Uh, first, I would like to uh, thank our administrative bargaining team that we've had this year. Uh, they did a fantastic job. Um, John Clemens always provides expert legal advice, which we greatly appreciate. Nancy Lane was part of the team and her work with doing all of the um, numbers, additions, and subtractions, and figuring salary schedules is just amazing. Uh, Mrs. Ogg was on the team this year. It was her first time bargaining in Fairfield. We appreciated her contributions. Katie Myers, our HR director, was involved. Uh, Mr. Rice represented the high school and freshmen. Ms. Francini represented the middle school, and Mrs. Hayes represented the elementary schools. They all did fantastic jobs, so couldn't have worked with a better, better team. I wanna mention that when we entered into bargaining, uh, part of our opening statement I wanna to read to you, um, bargaining is our opportunity to positively impact our students, our teachers, our administration, and our community. We will measure our success by our ability to hire and retain outstanding educators by the sound fiscal management of our resources and by the continuous academic improvement of our district. All of our decisions, meaning the board reps in the negotiations, will be built upon the principle of doing what is best for our over 10,000 students. Negotiations are successful when students have more opportunities, employees are treated fairly, and our district is a healthy organization with adequate resources for important district needs. So that's what we went in trying to do in our bargaining, and I feel that we, we did it. Um, the union has already ratified the proposed contract. They did that on April 6th, and it was ratified by a margin 347 for the new contract and 38 against. So it was really overwhelming. It was really a nice vote. And they, even though they did drive up voting at the high school, people didn't get out of their cars. They just drove up and voted. Uh, it was a larger turnout than we typically have voting for a contract. So we were thrilled with that. Uh, I wanna just talk about a couple areas. I know you've already received the summary of the bargaining. Um, the first and perhaps major, I know it was the the union's greatest concern was the finances. And what we settled on was a 2.5% raise for the three years of the contract. Uh, we also, the last time we bargained, uh, we raised the salary for uh, entry level teachers. And this time we addressed the salary of teachers who have been experienced and worked with us for quite a while. So there was a 1.5% index adjustment starting with uh, step 12 for teachers who are on the bachelor's plus, master's, master's plus, or psych uh, schedules, and a similar adjustment for our nurses and our athletic trainer. Um, we also now, because teachers, they used to be able to retire after 25 years or 30 years in education. Now they're working for 35 years as pretty much mandatory here in a few years. 
And so we added a step 27 to the teacher's salary schedule. Um, it did stop before at step 24. And we added a step 24 for our nurses and athletic uh, trainer salaries. Um, the only other compensation piece, direct compensation piece, was a few of our teachers, six teachers who were uh, leaders in our schools. Uh, their compensation increased by $400 a year. They were on tier one, and it changed the amount that they're going to be paid. Uh, and tier two teachers, there are four of those, and they also increased by $400 in, in leadership positions. Uh, the other major accomplishment in our contract, there were lots of language issues, but the major, um, I think, victory in our, our contract was we've had such a severe sub shortage over the past several years. Uh, it's hard to sometimes get our classes covered, and that was kind of a two-pronged uh, problem. One was the problem that we don't have enough substitute teachers um, in this with what's going on now, maybe we'll have more substitute teachers in the fall than we've had recently. But unemployment was so low, every teacher that wanted to teach was pretty much teaching. Um, so that was one of the problems. And the other prong had to do with um, our teachers being available to sub and being present um, in, in the school day. And so we've addressed those things. There were actually five things that we accomplished that will help us with our sub prices. Uh, the first one is that modular pay was increased from $5 for every 15 minutes that a teacher does an extra duty above and beyond their normal duties. It's called modular pay, and we paid them by the quarter hour. Uh, as long as I've been in the district, which is 26 years, uh, that modular pay has never changed. It's been $5 for every 15 minutes for the past 26 years, and probably sometime before that. Uh, that was raised to $8. Uh, that puts us more consistent with other school districts, and we felt that was a fair change. And that in and of itself, I think, will encourage some teachers to want to sub on their plan periods uh, to help us out with the sub shortage. Uh, the other language we got was that uh, teachers may now be required by administrators to sub on their plan period uh, at least two times a month if we have need of it. Up to two times a month they can be asked to sub. Uh, that was important language for us. Uh, a third item was that um, whenever in the elementary schools, sometimes if there's no sub available, they will take, uh, say there are five fourth grade teachers and one is absent, there's no sub available. They will take that teacher students and divide them and put them in the other classrooms. In the past, teachers who took additional students got no pay, and now they get a stipend for doing that. So that should help. Um, another one was a language issue where uh, members are now in the contract directed to uh, schedule medical and dental appointments uh, outside of workday whenever possible. And if it's not possible to schedule it outside the workday, that they would schedule it first thing in the morning or last thing in the evening so that they can be there the majority of the day to teach their students. So that was important. And then the fifth piece of that was um, we have shored up um, our effective ability to address excessive absences in our teachers. And so we now have a process placed in our contract that allows us to address that appropriately. So there were lots of other language issues that came apart. I'm not gonna take time to go through them all, uh, but there were major changes to the resident educator program. Uh, we totally revamped the extracurricular review process, which was very cumbersome and confusing to everybody. That's been revamped. And uh, we also bargained language for when we start OTES 2.0, it's the new updated version of the teacher evaluation system. It won't start the first year of our contract, but it'll start the second year, and we have the language and forms all prepared for that. So that's the synopsis of, of bargaining. I'd be glad to entertain any questions that you might have about the process or the outcome. Are there any questions for Mr. Martin? 
I just want to comment. Uh, it was a very successful bargaining session. Um, thank you very much, all who participated. Uh, you know, it puts us as a district in a better position than we were. And um, definitely we got some good wins as a, as a district. And I want to thank the teachers for bargaining in good faith, that uh, it was some, definitely some give and take on both sides so that we could continue to move forward uh, as a school district. Thank you. All right. Our next uh, item for board discussion uh, is 2020 school bus purchase. And I'll turn it over to Mr. Penny. Joe, you're on, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Excellent. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mr. Smith. And uh, Mr. Burry, members of the board, I come to you this evening with um, information regarding our 2020, um, one moment, our 2020 school bus purchase. Uh, this year, we're looking at purchasing five school buses. Uh, typically, the, typically, we purchase 72 passenger buses. Uh, that's been our standard in the past. This year, we're migrating, and we're going to go ahead and purchase 77 seats. Um, school buses. These school buses are the largest ones you can get from international that are conventional buses. And I guess of the five, we're purchasing four of those, which are the 77 passenger conventional buses. And then we're purchasing one of the smaller special needs handicap 54 passenger buses. Um, this is something that will be on the board agenda tonight for you to take action on. And it is within our current budget. Uh, to do so this year. Uh, is there any questions or discussion? Questions from the board? I do believe that uh, this is just part of our plan. We've been going year to year purchasing new buses and and uh, getting the older ones and the ones that are not functioning properly anymore out of our fleet. Correct, Mr. Penny? That is correct. And, and the, these buses are 18 to 19 years old. Mm -hmm. Um, and they are ready to leave our cycle. I'm sure Mr. Begley would like to know if we have drivers for those buses. Always <laughs> oh, this question. We, That's right. Well, going, going, going into COVID, we did, and we still do at this point. Haven't heard anything otherwise. Uh, we're doing our best even during this time period. If there's anyone that needs training to work through that. Uh, another thing with going with these 72 or 77 passenger buses instead of 72, it adds a little extra capacity within or on these buses. So that way, when we do have situations where it's a little tighter on the buses, we have some more flexibility regarding seating. And we'd like to continue doing these type of purchases in the future with adding those few extra spots within the buses. I was definitely uh, pleased to see that we were going with a little larger buses because we have had issues when having to double up um, on routes when we have bus driver shortages. So um, I'm in favor of moving to those purchases in the future. So I think that's great. Thank you for that work. No problem, thank you. All right, our next item for board discussion uh, it's just a brief COVID-19 update. Um, area of focus, uh, two areas of focus for this update in terms of um, teaching and learning and what's happening and also an update on our lunch program. Uh, so Mandy will be speaking about the teaching and learning portion and give you kind of an overview of what's happening and Jeff will give us an update on our lunches. I'll turn it over to Mandy. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Smith, uh, Mr. Birding, members of the board. Um, you might remember that on um, at our last board meeting, um, Mr. Mana and I gave a pretty detailed overview of what was going on in regards to teaching and learning and also the lunch program. So tonight is just a very brief update on, um, on those two things. So I'll provide you obviously with um, an update on teaching and learning. On April 6th, uh, when we returned from spring break, we provided teachers with updated guidelines to help 
uh, inform their instruction and their practice during this time of extended closure. Our goal in this, uh, in revising the original plan was to make teaching and learning more manageable for both our teachers and our students. Uh, this is a new experience uh, for all of us and you know, for some of our families, this is a very uh, difficult time. So our goal is to focus on building community and connection while focusing more on the process of remote learning versus the products of remote learning. So as you know, we cannot replicate the traditional school day in an online format, but we can stay connected and we can continue the learning process. And I think our teachers are doing a great job on both fronts. Um, you know, I mentioned that we provided updates for the teachers, but we did also create a document for parents on what to expect during remote learning. Uh, it has some great information and resources um, and also has an FAQ section that parents might find useful. So I would encourage parents uh, to check out the document, which can be found on the coronavirus page of our website. Um, and at this time, I will turn it over to Mr. Madden for an update on food service. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Ald. Um, I think last time we were together, uh, we discussed uh, the process that we were under in terms of providing lunches, which was a, a daily lunch provided. And um, we were going door to door in a lot of situations serving. We served close to 1,200 students per day uh, for a few weeks that way. Since we've come back from spring break, um, we have gone to a one day a week delivery, uh, or a, not a delivery, but a pickup. We have um, nine locations, and um, we are serving 2,000 students on Monday um, with a total of, of 10 meals, five lunches and five breakfasts um, for the week. So, and just to give you an idea of, of what, what that is, uh, one, those lunches are, are free for any child that shows up. Um, secondly, um, anyone, just to, so you're aware, anyone in, in really in the community, out, even outside of Fairfield, is actually eligible to, to show up on CNI. They're strategically placed um, for Fairfield families, obviously, um, but it is open to anyone. But we serve... Um, on a best day in our cafeterias, we serve maybe 4,000 students. So we're serving 2,000 students, and that's on a high day. You know, we average maybe 3,000 students. Um, so we feel like we're, we're very um, successful with this program. We like the one day a week. I think it's, it's worked out better for our kids, for our families. And uh, we're gonna increase as much as we can. We're gonna increase it by 300 for next week, we came really close. We feel like we came close this past Monday with the right number. Uh, we're gonna increase it by uh, two to 300 for next week um, as well. And uh, just go from there. We're, we're almost at capacity really. Uh, it, I talked to one of the food service ladies today and she said that this is harder than it is during the regular work week. So uh, a lot of work is done behind the scenes to, to prep for that amount of food being given out in one day. But, uh, so I've got. And before I um, turn it back to the board for questions and discussion, I, you know, I just want to say, you know, our focus throughout this whole COVID-19 situation, whether it be teaching and learning or nutrition or food service, it, you know, we've taken on the focus of we are here to serve our community, our kids and our families. And, we had a meeting the other day with our administrators and we talked about, you know, where we are living right now is we are flexible, we are patient, we are collaborative, and we are here to serve. And we know that our, we have kids, we have students that are very stressed. You know, you know, we, there's a lot of anxiety out there even prior to COVID-19. So suddenly, people's worlds are being turned upside down and we've talked about meeting our kids where they are and we have we have families that want more work than what they're getting and we have families that say we don't want any more please we're feeling overwhelmed so we are meeting them wherever they are um, whether it be teaching and learning whether it be 
you know, food service, um, you know, think about, I mean, nine sites. I've been at uh, one across from Crossroads and uh, just a team of people, they come together and fill two, 200 um, grocery paper sacks that are like, you know, five lunches and five breakfasts. And those families are so excited when they walk up, it's like Christmas morning. They, they just are so happy to get all that food um, for the week. Um, so I just can't say enough about our people. We have community volunteers, but a lot of our volunteers are our staff members. And that's another piece that's really touching when these kids and our staff members are signing up to serve where their kids are. And so they get to see each other and, and it's just awesome. Um, and one thing Mandy didn't uh, mention, I wanted to mention, um, you know, a great example. Uh, we've, we put a, once we figured out that we were going to be the the school closers were going to be expanded. Um, it was a ton of work, but we put a process in place as a district to distribute devices. We, we created a survey to say, Hey, who needs a device? And then, a group of people I went to sign up to volunteer and they were all the spots were gone, you know, within minutes. Um, so we had plenty of volunteers there. It was all day long. There was a line of cars, uh, at the high school. Um, people could have easily said, Oh, you know, that's just, that's a lot of work. Um, what if we don't get them back? Um, what if this, what if that, but we said, Hey, we have these devices. Um, it may not be perfect, but let's try to get them into the hands of our kids who may not have access. So um, just super proud of all of our folks and, 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 and Mandy and Jeff and these two areas um, being outstanding leaders. So, um, and, but just, just super proud of what's happening across the district, all for the, our kids and our, and our community members. So I just wanted to share that um, before we got too far along. Thank you, Mr. Smith.